I'd like to thank Villanova, and I'd especially like to thank the Kephart family for inviting me here tonight. And what I want to do is start with what is a hard question. What counts as an environmental crisis? We all think we know an environmental crisis when we experience it, but this is demonstrably not true. Like the Pope, and as the product of a Catholic education, it's good to agree with the Pope at a Catholic university. I think we're in the midst of a very big environmental crisis. But it's hard to identify on the basis of quotidian experience. Verification is not something you can do at home. Taking global temperature readings, measuring the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, calculating the rate at which glaciers are melting, and measuring sea level rise are outside of my personal toolkit. For most people, global warming's everyday consequences barely register. Droughts may be more severe, but they're still droughts. Storms may be more intense, but they're still storms. I think it's easier for me to say this on Thursday than it may be on Monday. Global warming creates difficulty for a second reason. Some academics have argued that it's different in kind. It's unlike anything that human beings have ever known. It is thus universal, but somehow visible only to experts. It is deadly, but it's tolerable in the short run. I, and I'm in a minority here, think that the difference in, differences in scale do not create differences in kind. There are common elements in past environmental crises. This is not a low-stakes academic debate. If global warming is unlike anything we have seen before, then previous experience can provide us with no guide. And I at least find it unfathomable that human beings can operate in a world where all prior experience is meaningless. This is a world of social dementia, where we are utterly unhinged and adrift. History, in any case, as a useful tool in the present, is not about answers. It is about questions. It cannot provide lessons, road answers to life's continuing questions, because circumstances always change. History only gives us the tools to ask the right kind of questions. And this comes from recognizing that things are similar even when they do not appear to be at first glance. To demonstrate this, I'm going to examine an environmental crisis that most contemporaries, most people who lived through it, through it did not even know was an environmental crisis. This failure to recognize an environmental crisis is not unusual. A few months ago, Gardner Harris wrote a story in the New York Times Magazine. He lived and worked in New Delhi. This is New Delhi up on the screen. He worked as a reporter, and his eight-year-old son, Bram, had asthma, which worsened there. One night, Harris and his wife found their son gasping for breath. Harris, of course, had recognized that New Delhi was badly polluted well before that night. He saw people living and defecating in the streets. He breathed New Delhi's atrociously bad air. He knew about its inadequate water system, its sewage, its vermin, and its disease. He knew that all these things were bad for his children. But only that night did the fact that this was an environmental crisis with immediate effects become palpable. New Delhi's pollution was no longer just an aspect of living in the city. It was the city's central fact. Gardner Harris's epiphany, the connection between the city's pollution and the potential loss of his child, jolted him into perceiving a crisis. But these kinds of epiphanies are rare. The same conditions affected the city's other 17 million residents. But for the most part, largely because of class and poverty, they remained only the unpleasant, if unavoidable, background of their lives. Harris decided to leave New Delhi, but this is not a solution open to most of the people who lived in its metropolitan area, and it is not a solution to most people involved in an environmental crisis. I'm interested in the experience of those other 17 million. If a crisis existed for Gardner, it existed for them, too. The population of New Delhi can stand in for 19th century Americans, 
who endured comparable conditions, ones that Jacob Reese summed up as how the other half lived. And this is a graph just showing death rates in Chicago, New York, Philadelphia between 1870 and 1930, which you can see going down. But the interesting thing is there is no clear pattern going down up until 1900. And these are much higher than anything you will have in New Delhi today. But surely the 19th century United States is not comparable to 21st century India. Of course, in many ways, it is not. But in other ways, the ways that concern me here tonight, it is. And if New Delhi is in an environmental crisis, so is the 19th century United States. For all the differences in details, there are big boxes that can be checked. High infant mortality, check. Reduced physical stature, check. Reduced lifespans, Check. Deadly epidemics? Check. Polluted water? Check. Polluted air? Check. Lack of adequate sewage and water systems? Check and check. Poor and dangerous housing? Check. New Delhi could be Pittsburgh, New York, Chicago, New Orleans, Boston, or even Philadelphia during the Gilded Age. In fact, it would rank above most of them. But I want to make an even larger claim. The urban environmental crisis during the Gilded Age was a part of a much larger American environmental crisis that lasted for the entire 19th century. Americans recognized many of its components, high, inf high infant death rates, tuberculosis, which I'll mention but won't talk about tonight, epidemics, particularly of waterborne diseases, deadly and disastrous fires. But these were all the trees. Americans did not identify the forest the environmental crisis itself. And there was a forest. And those particularly deep, dark woods disappeared in the early 20th century. We solved the crisis. Identifying the forest is important. It tells us something about what an environmental crisis looks like, even when people who live through it might not recognize it. But more than that, it can teach us how to interrogate a crisis and indicate the kinds of questions we need to get the solutions that lead us out of it. But first, I need to convince you that there was a forest, and that forest was environmental, and not just a collection of urban problems of the kind that Jacob Rees described. This, again, is showing New Delhi birth statistics, which are better than ours, but I'll skip to that. The key part of the 19th century crisis involved habitat loss. But it was human habitat, as well as that of other creatures. In this, it was like global warming. Now, there's an arrogance in my claiming to discern an environmental crisis when those who lived through it did not describe it in such terms. And there's even more arrogance in using the work of other scholars to discern a forest where they only describe the trees. I'm not more astute than they are. I've just come along at the right time. I have the advantage of a set of statistics that economists, historical demographers, and historians have compiled over the last 20 years. I, like most historians, have paid far too little attention to them. I have finally taken them seriously only because I'm writing the Gilded Age volume of the Oxford History of the United States. The first set of statistics measures average life expectancy at birth. They're not all up here. I'll show you some later. The second measures the average life expectancy for somebody who reached 20. In other words, how much longer did you have to live if you managed to reach adulthood? The third measure is adult height, which can stand in for childhood disease and nutrition, which is an element, again, I won't talk a lot about tonight. In the 19th century, all three sets of numbers trended in the direction of trouble. Life was not getting better for Americans in the 19th century. If we use these measures of well-being, it was getting worse. As anyone knows who's worked with historical statistics, there are problems with the numbers. These numbers, however, are more likely to overestimate than underestimate American well-being, since by and large they measure the condition of white, native-born males. And if anything was certain about 19th century America, it was that it was better to be white than black, male than female, and native-born rather than immigrant. If the measures are bad for the most privileged group, then things were not looking good for much of anyone. And the measures were bad. 
The average life expectancy of a white man, once he reached the age of 20, seems to have dropped from the 1790s into the last decades of the 19th century, with the decline greatest in the cities. A clear trend towards longer lifespans for white men was not visible until the 1880s, and as you can see in this chart, it's not even clearly visible then. It would be the 20th century before white American men, on the average, lived as long as 18th century New England men. Black men lagged far behind. Early childhood formed the most dangerous years. A person reaching 20 had, on average, more years to live than an average baby at birth. That's worth pausing over. If you made it to 20, you had more years to live than the average baby when it was born in the United States. Between 1850 and 1890, the chances of an American white child dying before the age of five were between 25 and 30 percent, with a sharp bump in the 1880s, and then falling again, this is the height chart, and falling again by 1890. Again, black children died in far greater numbers than white in comparable situations. Dramatic changes in childhood mortality awaited the 20th century. And the crisis involved more than mortality. Figures on height are confined to white native-born males, thus ruling out distortions from the arrival of potentially smaller immigrants. They have yielded the so-called dem antebellum puzzle, which is a decline of mean male height about an inch from 1830 to 1870. Americans were getting smaller. Something is going on when a people not in body mass but in height begins to shrink. The generation born in the 1880s formed the nadir in terms of average height. And since height serves as a surrogate for nutrition and health during early childhood, we can surmise that both are to blame. No matter what progress Americans talked about in the 19th century, by these basic physical measures, things were not getting better. Things were getting worse. There's a final set of numbers. When passport records are compared to those taken from the general population, passport holders were uniformly taller than Americans as a whole. Since the passports went overwhelmingly to people from the middle and upper classes, it appears that they, like aristocrats in European records, were not equally affected by the conditions driving down height and lifespan. When sorted further to find differences between rural and urban passport holders, those outside the cities showed a height advantage. It would appear then that over the course of the 19th century, the general well-being of the population declined. In the Gilded Age, the crisis was most intense in the cities. For black people and poor and immigrant urban dwellers, the crisis continued the longest. The environmental crisis hurt everyone but it hurt the poor the most. Now, I don't want to measure the environmental crisis to these measures of health and well-being. It not only ravaged and destroyed American bodies, it ravaged and destroyed what Americans, let's come back to these in a second, it ravaged and destroyed what Americans regarded as a sign of their progress, their lands and their cities. On October 8, 1871, Fires burning in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, exploded into an inferno that consumed not only the cutover of slash and stumps from white pine lands, but also standing forests, farms, and towns. Before this single fire was over, it had killed up to 1,500 people. The fire is little remembered today because it happened the exact same day as the Great Chicago Fire. More than chronology clinked linked the two fires. The same dry weather and strong winds fueled both, but beyond that, Chicago was a great lumber emporium of the country. Some of the trees cut around Peshtigo passed through Chicago's lumber yards. Others became part of the city itself, incorporated in the small wooden cottages that housed much of the working class. This is a picture of the O'Leary's cottage, which is Mrs. O'Leary's cow, who supposedly started the fire. This cottage belonged to Catherine and Patrick O'Leary, and the Chicago fires started in their wooden barn on the southwest side of Chicago. Mrs. O'Leary's cow took the blame for kicking over a lantern. Remember that cow. It was not an unusual resident of Chicago. 
it tells you much about the environmental crisis. Strong winds whipped the flame and drove them northeast towards the industrial district, where vast piles of timber shipped in from the forest to the north, coal heaps, and wooden warehouses provided, as one commentator noted, everything that would make a good fire. The fire disabled the waterworks, and the city's pumping station, depriving firemen of the ability to fight it. Remember those waterworks. If you've been to Chicago, you've seen them. This was the famed Chicago water tower that survived the fire. The fire burned itself out on Chicago's northern boundaries, four and a half miles from the O'Leary's barn. It had covered 2,100 acres, destroyed 18,000 buildings, and killed approximately 300 people. It left about 75,000 people, one quarter of the city's population, homeless. By way of comparison, this year's two largest California fires had by late September destroyed 1,500, 1500 buildings and killed six people. These 19th century fires routinely ravaged, cut over forests, the West and Midwest, and American cities. I could go on, but we have enough. A century of environmental crisis that shortened American lifespans, killed large numbers of American children, and destroyed immense amounts of American property. Americans did not regard this as normal or dismiss it as the human condition. In 1865, the nation pointed out that New York's death rate was 50% higher than London's, and its infant mortality was twice as high. The United States was doing something wrong. There are few crises that do not promise political advantage for someone. And even as 19th century Americans proposed technical solutions, they do what Americans did. They fought bitterly over how to allocate the costs and the benefits of a new environmental order. They fought in the main over fire and over water. Water, abundant pure water, became central to the fight against fire and disease. I will start with fire and water because together they can more easily establish the connection between environmental crisis, politics, and the economy. American engineers proved quite adept at bringing water into the cities. Starting in New York in the 1840s, they built municipal water systems in most major cities and continued to do so after the Civil War. Larger cities led the way. And for simplicity's sake, I'm going to concentrate on Chicago and New York. New York first brought water from the Croton River to this reservoir, which is where the New York Public Library stands today. Essentially what this is is a giant water fort. Behind the walls is water. This is the water that supplied New York City. Chicago pumped its water in from two miles out in Lake Michigan. The Chicago Water Tower held a standpipe to equalize pressure in the system. This is the original pumping station. Any of you fly into Chicago today, if you come in over the lake, you'll see the new pumping station. This one was two miles out. The one now is four miles out, because as the water gets dirtier, you've got to keep going further out in Lake Michigan to get pure water. These urban water systems helped curtail massive fires. In this sense, they worked, but only as part of a larger rearrangement of the city's political economy. The Great Chicago Fire reminded Chicagoans that fire does not respect social or class boundaries, in much the same way global warming doesn't. Fires that start in poor neighborhoods spread into, destroy, into and destroyed rich ones. This meant that the water system could not be confined to those who could afford to pay for it. It had to extend through the entire city and protect all neighborhoods, or it did little good at all. This was self-interest, but self-interest cut both ways. The wooden structures that had fed the flames of the Great Chicago Fire were largely the homes of the working poor. Insurance companies, then and now, had a lot to say about what happened. Insurance companies demanded that water systems and hydrants be put in, but they also refused to reinsure any buildings in a substantially wooden city. This led business interests to press for building codes that would largely eliminate the cottages that people like the O'Leary's lived in, which were, of course, the only houses that the poor could afford. Protecting the city from fire spawned a battle that was fought in overtly class terms. 
the property classes won. Wooden houses did not disappear, but newer ones were pushed out of the city proper, re-entering it only when the city expanded and incorporated them. Workers paid for solving this part of the crisis. They paid increased housing prices, and more and more were forced into tenements. But at least you might think they had water. Most of them did not, at least initially. There were water mains, but they needed to be connected to residences and businesses. And both businessmen and politicians knew that fire and disease were bad for growth, but business also knew that paying for this would increase property taxes, and they owned most of the property. So to pay for the water systems, and later the sewage system, they struck a compromise with the Chicago political machine that was typical of the period. The environmental crisis leads to finance. The city would sell bonds to build the water and sewer system and then pay off the bonds by having a relatively high hookup fee and water rates that privilege big users over small users. The results were predictable. The very affluent as well as the businesses immediately hooked up to the systems. The middle class delayed and the poor who often depended on the decision of their landlords had to rely on public fountains and public pumps to get their water. When landlords did connect, they often had a single sink or faucet for all their tenants, including retail businesses. This limited access to water created a kind of disgusting multitasking in the tenements. In one New York building at the end of the century, inspectors found that a fishmonger used a ground floor sink to wash his fish. It also provided water for a baker who used the same sink. At night, the building's tenants used it as a urinal. Which brings us to, and I'll put this delicately so I don't sound like a character from South Park, oral fecal contamination. Human feces and, I'll come to her in a second, and urine allowed the communication of typhoid, dysentery, and cholera, which were the great killers of the period. This was not just a problem for the poor, because like fire, diseases did not observe social boundaries. Theodore Roosevelt's mother, Martha Roosevelt, was known for her obsession with cleanliness. But she died of typhoid in New York in 1884, probably from vegetables washed in contaminated water. Martha Roosevelt, in effect, died of bad political economy. The bacteriological revolution, and with it an accurate understanding of how bacterial diseases were communicated, was already taking place, but that didn't save British sanitarians, as health reformers were called, had long known that like fire systems, water systems, were to, if they were to work, they had to serve everyone. What was true of water was even truer of cities, sewers. Before and after the bacteriological revolution, Americans believed in the environmental origins of disease. The cause was miasma. Here I should just, how many of you have ever heard of miasma? There's some who know miasma. Miasma is actually coming back. Um, if any of you have seen the recent thing that we all carry our own personal bacterial cloud, which is referred to among some environmental historians as the fart cloud, um, the BBC started returning, referring to this as their own personal miasma. And this is actually from a BBC story. This becomes microbial miasma that surrounds all of us. What they're bringing back now as a metaphor, or really as a real thing, something that was neither metaphorical nor personal in the 19th century. It wasn't smoke or pollution. It's more like a vapor. And its palpable signs were dampness, foul odors, and haziness. Miasma arose from decaying matter and stagnant water. It penetrated human bodies when people breathed, ate, drank, and touched each other. This is why 19th century Americans thought people got sick. This was why wetlands were such a deadly landscape. But health reformers, the decay was not just in swamps. It had to do with disease and decay of any kind. Miasma also occurred in cities. It occurred in cities because of filth. This is the London Health Board looking for the causes of miasma. To prevent cholera in 1866, the New York Board of Public Health had issued 7,600 orders against nuisances as dangerous to life and detrimental to health. 
This is what a cow comes back in. It mandated the removal of 160,000 tons of manure from vacant lots in New York City. It had 6,481 privies disinfected. People were still not connected to the sewers. But the Board of Health had no power to prevent privies, overflowing cesspools, abandoned dead animals, and the rest. They only had the power to order their removal when they came in. And this will be this association between health and disease, or cleanliness and disease, which will continue throughout the 19th century. As late as 1892, the Chicago Tribune emphasized that cholera is born of filth. It lives upon filth. It is spread by filth. The first duty of cities, therefore, is to clean up. To clean up, you have to ex exercise public power. And at first, the New York Board of Health had used nuisance law and the common law doctrine of salus populi. Originally, those who caused the mess were supposed to clean the mess up. But what happens when those who cause the mess are so powerful that they can just say no? There's a rough egalitarianism in defecation. We all contribute pretty much the same amount, but pollution is uneven. In Chicago, the largest polluters were the slaughterhouses, but they were also the largest employers and the largest businesses. Manure, offal, and wastes of all kinds went directly into the Chicago River, fouling it in Lake Michigan, which is why the outlet for the water system was moved from two miles to four miles out. The packing houses simply refused to clean up, and when the city tried to force them to clean up, they threatened to leave. The city backed down. Instead, it opted for grander and grander technical solutions, which eventually involved what we get in modern Chicago, reversing the course of the Chicago River and creating the aptly named Sanitary Canal. All of the wastes in Chicago were pumped into rivers going downstate, other places in Illinois. But this technical solution also required a political and social adjustment. Under nuisance laws, those creating the pollution would have to pay for cleaning it up. But Chicago now taxed everyone to pay for the solution. And this involves a major step. What this means is polluters will get the profit from their pollution, but cleaning up the price of their pollution is a cost that's passed on to everyone. Everyone in the city pays the cost, but the profit goes to a few. This is a redistribution of income upwards. There's a theme here. The environmental crisis created a situation that hurt everyone, but the initial solutions helped the affluent while assigning a disproportionate set of costs to the working poor. The same thing was true of sewers, which replicated the problem while creating a new problem. I'll simply point out that just as water systems are supposed to bring pure water in, sewers are supposed to take waste out. As with water systems, however, cities charged hookup fees that made sewers much more widely used and prosperous rather than poor neighborhoods. At the end of the century, after years of agitation, of the 255,000 people who fell under the New York Tenement House Committee's inspection, only 306 had access to bathrooms in the houses in which they lived. They built a sewer system. They knew the cause of what they wanted to get rid of it for. But in fact, only 366 of 255,000 had, had access to those sewer systems. The result is going to be the disgusting aspect of 19th century cities. Cesspools overflowed, privies overflowed, people defecated and urinated in basements and in the streets. You had situations which usually we associate with cities like New Delhi. As the century wore on, rising populations made sewers more and more necessary. But so did the new abundance of water and a change in the ecology of cities from a closed loop to an organic, to an open loop. These last two need a brief explanation. Annie Bell in New York was, as the historian Ted Steinberg has argued, an organic city. The waste that went out, human waste called night soil, as well as the manure from the cows and horses and pigs in New York City. All of these things went to farms on Long Island, which grew food, which came back into the city. The city had a closed loop. It was, in this sense, going to be organic. The waste that went out came back in 
as food. And the animals in the city not just produced waste, pigs ended up being the major street cleaners in a city like New York. They're particularly mean and ugly and unpleasant street cleaners, but what they did do is keep the city free of waste. But as you begin to confine animals, you confine the cows from Mrs. O'Leary's cow to an urban dairy, what you begin getting is other kinds of disease. You feed them on brewery slops. Brewery slops might seem part of a closed loop, but the brewery slops produces blue milk, which carries typhoid and becomes one of the major causes of infant death rates in Chicago. The pigs you can find to what now is Central Park and later to islands in the East River. As these animals now defecate, those wastes no longer go to farms. They begin to be dumped into the river. Human wastes eventually find their way to the river. And when, in fact, you get the sewer systems working, more and more of the wastes are going to be conveyed directly into the river. The results, again, are predictable. An attempt to solve an environmental crisis ex actually extenuates it. In New York in 1879, a boring at West 13th Street in the outfall of the East River had to pass through 175 feet of sewage and sludge before it found the bottom of the harbor. 175 feet of sewage and sludge. Cities were known for their stink. The city's decaying waters produced nitrogen. The deforestation of the Hudson River produced phosphorus. The oxygen levels in the rivers surrounding the city declined, and signs of eutrophication appeared. The city was killing the waters all around it. Abundant water was supposed to make this better, but it made it worse. Water closets, which contained flush toilets, were widely adapted by the middle class but all this did, until you were hooked up to the sewers, is increase the amount of water flowing into the cesspool, which caused the cesspools to overflow, which caused, in fact, feces and urine to be embedded in the soil. There's more and more possibilities for oral fecal contamination, and we find the disease rate is not going down, despite the improvements. This could be solved by connection to sewers, but as more and more wastewater flowed into the sewers, they further overwhelmed the rivers, lakes, and oceans. Tides were supposed to wash all of this away, but the problem with tides in New York is they come in as well as go out. A reporter writing of Coney Island noted, it was not pleasant when you're tumbling in the surf to have a decayed cabbage stalk or the carcass of a dead cat hit you full in the face. I found few irrefutable statements in the Gilded Age press, but I'm pretty sure this was one of them. The reporter was lucky that he didn't recognize what else was in that water. The solutions were becoming problems even as the original problems persisted. A study conducted at the end of the century described the outside insanitary conditions and behind the yards, a working class neighborhood near the Chicago stockyards, as quote, as bad as anything in the world. Indescribable accumulations of filth and rubbish together with the absence of sewerage makes the surrounding conditions abominably insanitary. After Half a century of public health efforts and infrastructure improvements, the environmental crisis persisted. We don't usually think of taxes and property rights as environmental factors, but they are. The protections given to property exceeded the protections given to people. And this could be shown, I'm not going to give you the statistics, on tuberculosis, where the tuberculosis rates among the rich and the poor were astronomically different running more than 10 times higher among the poor. Now, these were not insoluble problems. Things did not get particularly better, as the statistics show, over the time. Again, this just goes back to that, but let me go back to the statistics. The statistics do not show things getting better until really the 20th century, but it's not as because people were not trying to solve it. And it's not as if, in fact, many of these elements were not useful. Bringing in fresh water was good. Increased sewage was better. But in fact, if you don't hook everybody up to them, if in fact there are going to be property qualifications and cost qualifications, then you are not going to begin to dent the problem. They were developing new scientific advances in medicine, but they're not going to have much of an effect until the 20th century. They created new public authorities, but unless you gave them the power to actually intervene and change conditions and not just cite people for creating the conditions, they were not going to change much of anything. 
eventually they are going to conquer an environmental crisis, one they did not fully recognize by addressing not just the environmental components of this, but the economic, political, and social aspects that helped create it. And in this, they provide us with a fruitful source of questions. And here again, I will join with the Pope in summarizing what I take away from this eventual success. All of these things could be solved, but it took almost a century to solve them. And the questions we need to ask about the environmental crisis in the present are not just technological questions. We have all kinds of technological fixes we could use, but the crisis cannot be purely environmental. It has to be part political. It has to be part economic. It has to be part social. And unless you address those particular political, economic, and social questions, unless you recognize, as the Pope did, that they affect the poor more than the rich, but that in affecting the poor, if you look at the well-being of the society as a whole, things go down. These things also show something else. One of the things you will hear over and over again is that a rising tide is going to lift all boats. That in fact, if the economy improves, of course, the environmental conditions are going to improve. Human health is going to improve. Human well-being is going to improve. The 19th century flies in the face of that. In the 19th century, there is economic growth, growth in per capita income. There's problems with distribution, but by every measure, the critical thing by every measure of human well-being that we can regain from that, people's lives are getting worse. They're not getting better. So to simply think that, you, that economic growth is going to take care of it, technical solutions are going to take care of it, those are not the kinds of issues that arise from looking at the 19th century crisis. But on the other hand, neither is it hopeless. After a century of declining markers of well-being by the 20th century, it will begin to rise. The United States did get out of it. Things did end up getting better. But they only got better when, in fact, people found more than technical solutions, but began to rearrange the whole society to overcome what had become environmental barriers. Thank you.